Hello, fellow birders. My name is Dennis Kania. Today we're going to talk about steps you can take to improve the efficiency of your birding experience. On the DuPage Birding Club education channel, we'll be discussing all things bird related. And as I mentioned, we'll be talking about ways to improve your birding experience, or what I like to refer to as avoiding the pitfalls of birding or becoming a better birder. The first step that you can take to improve your birding experience is to actually take out your field guide and go through the entire book and try to become familiar with all the species that are available. The first time you see a bird in the field shouldn't be the first time that you actually see an image of that, that species. If you go through and look at these uh, illustrations before your field, your field experience, your eye will be trained automatically to look for certain features and having that familiarity enhances that. So it really does pay to go through and look at all of these birds so that the first time you see them is not in the field. Second thing that you can do is to not take common species for granted. Common species are great for practicing your, your skills in the backyard or you know, around local bird feeders or whatever. So take common species like the American Robin and really take a close look at it. You can see that all of these are American Robins, but they all do have some differences and being able to recognize them as what they are and ignoring some of those differences will be key to your recognizing certain birds in the field. And certainly you should be able to recognize a, co a common bird like the American Robin very easily. but by going through this exercise again and again, and taking close looks at birds, you'll be prepared for those odd birds that you might not be familiar with. And one thing I like to do is to close my eyes and try to envision the bird and actually describe it. And when you can do that, you really own that bird. So you're committing as many details to memory as you possibly can. And again, it's, it's easy to do in your own backyard with common species. Use your time wisely in the field. When you are out in the field looking at birds, some of your encounters may be very, very brief. So you should be looking at the bird at all times, trying to get as many details off of that bird as you possibly can. The one thing you should not be doing is pulling out your field guide and looking at the bird and then trying to look things up in the field guide to get some characteristics ironed out and then looking back at the bird. By then the bird could very well be gone. And now you don't know if it did have yellowish undertail coverts or whitish undertail coverts. So the best thing to do is to prepare for your experiences by looking at your field guide beforehand, being prepared for birds that you might see in the field, and then knowing what to look for when you do come across them. Know before you go, and that's pretty much what I'm talking about. So let's say that you're going out to uh, one of our local forest preserves and you saw on eBird that someone had just seen an orange crowned warbler and you've never seen one. You really wanna add that to your list. So what you need to do is you look in your field guide before you go in the field and you say, you know, what, what does an orange crowned warbler look like and what would be other candidates that would look very similar? So it wouldn't take you long to realize that in the fall, a Tennessee warbler can look very, very much like an orange crowned warbler. So, you make those determinations on what are the key things to look at before you're in the field. And there's many, many examples of things that you can look at. It's anything basically that you're unfamiliar with. So let's say it's um, you've struggled with how to tell the difference between a sharp shinned hawk and a cooper's hawk. Well, that would be something to study before you go in the field. Or how do I tell the difference between a downy woodpecker and a hairy woodpecker? So you, it's uh, again, something else that you would sort out before you go out in the field. So doing your, your field uh, guide work before you go in the field is probably one of the smartest things that you can do. And then after your field experience, you might still have questions. So then you can enhance uh, what you've learned in the field by going back and reviewing after your field experience. I like to tell my classes that uh, the best time uh, to look in your field guide is before class and then after class and to leave your field guide in the car when you go out and do your birding. You should concentrate solely on the bird that's in front of you. Another thing to take into consideration is watching out for what I call visual snares. And visual snares are things that you know make your eye pop. 
So in the case of this ruby crowned kinglet, you can see it has this ruby red crown. And when it's flared out like this, it really catches your eye. And lots of times you'll be trapped by that. You get stuck on that red patch and then you fail to see anything else. Uh, if that red patch isn't there, uh, if the crown is closed, then the next thing you might get trapped on would be this busy pattern here in the wing. And then you fail to look at some of the other features and then asking questions later, you won't realize what color the upper parts were here or what color the throat was or the belly or the flanks or the undertail covers. So in order to get a full read on everything about the bird, you want to make sure that you don't get stuck on one particular characteristic. If you look at this female rose-breasted grosbeak, you're going to be kind of trapped by this patterning in the head here. And then you won't even realize, did this bird have a wing bar or not? Or was there actually streaking on the breast? And these are all questions you might have then when you go to your field guide. So try to look over the entire bird. And one way to do that is to develop a mental checklist that will encourage you to look at all parts of the bird. So in your mental checklist, you would include things uh, as far as topography of the bird that would entail all the different features you might see on a head pattern, uh, what's happening in the wing. And we actually have a tutorial on this, on bird, to, uh, bird topography, and you can look that one up and we'll really pay to review that, I think. When you do come across a bird, especially one that you maybe haven't had a lot of experience with, maybe it's the first time you've seen it, it's really a good idea to stick with that bird as long as you can. I have an example here of an Eastern tohi. And so maybe this is your first encounter and you can see a lot of the basic field marks and you can easily identify it as an Eastern tohi. But if you continue to watch that bird and look for behavior and watch it as it moves through the environment and you get different looks as it's doing that, it may turn its back to you or be above you. And so you're, you're seeing different aspects of the bird. And pretty soon you start to create a series of images that will remind you of Eastern Tohi the next time you see them. So in this case, you might see that the undertail covers, which I've blown up here, you can see they're kind of this cinnamony buff color. And that's kind of unique to this species. You can see that there are these large white patches in the corners of the tail. You can see that the outer edges of the tertials create these kind of upside down teardrop shapes. And that could be diagnostic. Here's a picture of the bird, let's say, that's flying away. And so you can see what patterning there is in the wing. All of these things may at some point in time be a benefit to you because you, the next look you have at an Eastern Tohi may be a fleeting look. And this is why it seems that experienced birders can identify birds more quickly or with only an obscured view. It's because they do have a series of images that are buried in their mind. I like to refer to it as a Rolodex of pictures. And your, um, the image that you currently see in the field may, may strike a chord for something that you already have you know, seen in the past. And that refreshing of your memory will say, oh wait, that was, that was something that I've seen on an Eastern Tohi before. Another thing I'd like you to consider is that you should be thinking twice about relying on size. And when you see an image like this, which is in a controlled situation, it's quite obvious that a downy woodpecker is smaller than a hairy woodpecker. But if you were to see a downy woodpecker on a large snag, you'll see it looks one size and it's going to look a bit smaller. And then if you get that same downy woodpecker out on little branches, little twigs, it tends to make the bird look larger. And what's happening is that the, um, the perspective on size is influenced by the surroundings of the bird. So that, same, that very same bird can look different depending on what kind of backgrounds you have. And we actually have a tutorial on um, telling the difference between hairy and downy woodpecker. And so you can go back and revisit that tutorial as well. Don't let familiarity lead you to taking things for granted. Quite often we get used to seeing certain birds in certain places and we tend to get a little bit lazy as we're going down a trail or just looking out in our backyard. So maybe we see house finches all the time uh, in our backyard or going down a certain trail. And you want to make sure that you look at all of them even though um, you're convinced that it's probably just going to be that same house finch you saw the day before because you never know when it might possibly be that purple finch. Same thing goes for siskins, maybe at your feeder, and you'll see this little streaky bird. 
um, darting around and working its way around on the ground, but it's back to you and it has this all this streaking going on and next thing you know you realize that one of them has a little bit of a different bill and a black chin and a little bit of red hair up on the crown. This is a female common red pole and looks and look very much like the bodding patterning of what we have on this pine siskin. So you could easily overlook something like that. And other things that you might end up overlooking that would be a shame if you missed out on them would be something like, let's say, a spotted tohi when you think you're just looking at a eastern tohi or brewer's sparrow because you thought it was just a um, odd, odd plumaged um, chipping sparrow or prairie warbler. That happened to me last year. I was out at Fermilab and we were, it was in spring migration. We had a lot of warblers around us and we were in some thick vegetation, really a lot of uh, scrub. And I saw this bird that I saw pumping its tail and I just took a real quick look at it. I didn't have much of a view because it was very much obscured. And so as I was looking at it and I looked away after that quick view and I started to walk away and all of a sudden I realized that that bird had yellowish wing bars. So I quickly looked back at it and, and it was a bird I almost wrote off as a palm warbler just because it was pumping its tail. So you have to be careful to not take things for granted. And you can always be learning more and more about those common birds anyway, as we talked about earlier. So the more you look at them, the, the more you're going to learn. Positioning can make a big difference in your birding. And I have a couple of examples here. Here's a, a yellow-throated warbler shot <clears throat> up against a, a blue sky. And so we really have a very difficult time getting color off of this. This could just as easily have been a black Burnian warbler as a yellow throated warbler with this kind of a view. But if you can manage to maneuver yourself so that there's now a dark solid background behind the bird, it's much easier to see all those markings and you can certainly see the colors a lot better. After tramping up through the mountains uh, in Big Bend National Park to see a Kalima warbler, this isn't the view that you want to walk away with a silhouetted view. So you want to make sure that you can get this bird with some kind of a background in it. And this is much more of a rewarding view of a Kalima warbler. So as you plan your routes as you're birding, you want to try and take advantage using the trails in such a way that you, for the most part, will have the sun behind you. The more you can do that, the more luck you're going to have. Otherwise, you're going to have to play games in order to position yourself to get more solid backgrounds behind uh, the image that you're trying to see. One thing that I'd really like you to focus on is that we need to respect the birds that we're, that we're finding. And there have been so many advancements in photography equipment and recording equipment and various birding apps. And all of these things can be used to enhance our enjoyment of birds, certainly. And I encourage that. However, often I see them being used in less than responsible ways. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, repeated playing of recordings is, is, is basically harassment of the birds. And this is especially true during in breeding territories. I have come across people, I had a field trip out one time with one of my art breeding classes and we were at Ellison's Hill and we were hearing a blue winged warbler. And so I'm bringing my class up the trail, hoping to get a good look at a, a blue winged warbler because I knew that they hung around in this, this certain field. So as we turned the corner and we came into view, there was a photographer standing in the middle of the field, waiting with his camera and just blasting the sound of a, a blue-winged warbler. Well, that's, that's, not the, that's not the way to bird. So um, we, need, we need to make sure that we're birding responsibly. Chasing birds for that perfect photograph is not the right thing to do either. Or just to even get a look at a bird uh, and walking into um, sensitive uh, habitat or uh, restricted areas, you should, those are things that also you should not be doing. We all want to enjoy birds as much as possible, but it's, and it's difficult to uh, assess just how much uh, our repeated stresses on these birds are, are affecting the health of them. But just keep in mind that if we want others to be able to see the birds as well, we can't be chasing them away all the time or harassing them or scaring them, terrifying them with uh, bird calls that are being played too loud or, or whatever. So let's not love them to death. And that's, I think, out of the uh, items I've talked about today, this is probably one of the most important ones. So here we do have a list of those simple rules that I think we can all benefit from following. Um, become familiar with all the birds in your field guide. Don't take common species for granted. They provide good practice. And when there is a bird to be looked at, look at that bird. Don't be looking in your field guide. The time to look in your field guide 
is before your birding experience. So know before you go. Sort out those ID puzzles before your field trip. And don't get caught up with bright colors or busy patterns. Make sure that you come up with a way so that you're actually looking at the entire bird. And stick with the bird as long as you can and learn more features and behaviors of that bird so that the next time you encounter it, you'll be more uh, prepared for uh, an identification. Keep in mind that size is not necessarily a useful feature. We can be deceived at times by the surrounding habitat that the bird is found in. Expect the unexpected and take a close look rather than assuming that the same bird that you saw yesterday is there on the trail today. It could be something different. Avoid backlighting if, all, if at all possible. A solid background can make all the difference. And bird ethically, don't let your desires stress out those birds that you want to see. So thanks for taking the time to view this video. Hopefully we've given you some bird food for thought. And I hope you'll join us again in the future as we explore all things bird related 